So school shootings as a phenomenon in American life start, really started in 1996 when a kid named Barry Lucatus uh, dresses up uh, in a black duster and walks into Frontier Middle School in uh, Moses Lake, Washington State. <clears throat> and he's got two handguns and a hunting rifle and 78 rounds of ammunition. And he kills his algebra teacher and kills two other students in the class. Um, and in the, in the two years that follow that shooting, there are six other major incidents in relatively quick succession. And then comes Columbine. That happens in April of 1999, three years after Barry Lucatus. And from there, things take off. You go through Virginia Tech. Remember, 32 people die and 17 wounded. Uh, and then you get the 27 people killed by Adam Lanza at Sandy Hook in 2012, um, right up to the 10 shot two days ago uh, in Oregon. And if you're, the statistics are more than a little sobering. Just since Sandy Hook, we've had 142 school shootings in this country, and we've had 45 just in the past year. Um, if you look at this history, two things stand out immediately. One is that this is a very contemporary phenomenon. There is very little that happens of this sort before 1996. Um, the second thing that's obvious if you look at the history of school shootings is that it's an overwhelmingly American phenomenon. Uh, to the extent that anything like this happens anywhere else in the world, it appears to happen uh, as a reflection of something going on here. It appears to have spread from America, but no one has the numbers that we have in this, in this country. But beyond those two facts, the real puzzle of school shootings is that they don't fit any kind of discernible pattern. What I want to do this afternoon, is this morning, is to offer one very tentative um, idea for making sense of school shootings, uh, using John Ledoux as the example. And that idea is based on the work of a sociologist named Mark Granovetter, uh, who is one of the great sociologists of, of uh, the last 50 years. So Granovetter writes a paper in the early 1970s. It's one of his most famous papers, and it's about riots. And riots have always been a great puzzle for sociologists because uh, they don't make any sense. A riot is a, a phenomenon in which a lot of people do things that they would normally never do, right? Riots are typically full of people committing act of, acts of violence for whom acts of violence are normally unthinkable. And so for as long as there have been riots, people have tried to come up with theories to explain them. And in the 17th and 18th and 19th century, the idea was that the riot cast a kind of intoxicating spell on its participants, right? This is the, the madding crowd idea. The, in the French Revolution, there's a famous book written about the madness of crowds. But that idea falls out of favor um, because there's all kinds of logical inconsistencies with it. And in its place uh, comes in the middle part of the 20th century an idea that suggests that what a riot is is uh, participants in riots are rational actors that they are, at the moment they decide to join, they are engaging in a logical analysis of the costs and benefits of participating in this particular activity. Then Granovetter comes along and he says, look, all of these notions are ridiculous. The problem with them is they're all trying to explain the riot by looking at each individual participant in the riot in isolation. And he says, you can't do that. That a riot is a social phenomenon. It's a group phenomenon in which people join the, and people join the riot by, uh, by looking at and evaluating their behavior in response to the people who are already rioting, right? So for him, for Granovetter, the key thing about a riot is not people's beliefs, but rather what he calls their thresholds. And his definition of a threshold is simply uh, the number of people who need to be doing something before you're willing to join in. And he comes up with this incredibly elegant hypothetical model of how a riot works using thresholds. So he says, look, the first person, the person who throws the rock through a window has a threshold of zero. They don't need anyone else to be rioting to start a riot under certain conditions of provocation. They're a radical, right? Then the next person is, is someone who would never be the first to throw a rock. They don't believe in throwing rocks. But if somebody else is going to do it, they're like, OK, I, I'm willing to join in as long as someone else goes first. They have a threshold of one. Then comes the person with a threshold of two. They'd never do it if they were the first. They wouldn't even do it if there was one person there. But if there's two, 
then they'll feel comfortable joining in. And then comes the person who has a threshold of three who will join in if there's three people already doing it. And you go all the way up. If you've got 100 people, Grandmother says the last person in is the person with a threshold of 99. And the person with a threshold of 99 is a righteous, upstanding citizen who would never, ever dream of ever rioting, except if absolutely everyone else is rioting, right? That 99th person is essentially my mother, right? <laughs> She'd never, but if everyone's doing it, all right, all right, all right, I'll do it. And everything changes with Columbine. Um, Harris, what Harris and Klebold do is they lay down the script for how school shootings are supposed to work. So they have, for the first time, school shooters create their own media. So Harris and Klebold, they have a website, remember, they have videos they put up on YouTube, they do these home movies starring themselves as hitmen, they write these lengthy manifestos, they record the basement tapes, right, in which they give all of their reasons for what they're doing, they have the notebook with all of the plans spelled out. They have a, their motivations are expressed with this kind of grandiose specificity. Um, Harris, at one point, Eric Harris says, you know, that he wants to kickstart a revolution. He intends to be the kind of father of the whole school shooting movement. And that's exactly what happens. You know, the sociologist Ralph Larkin has looked at um, the school shootings that come after Columbine and looked at the of the 12 major school shootings that happen in the eight years after Columbine, uh, more than half explicitly reference Columbine, are in some sense reenactments of what happens. If you look at the 11 shootings that were major shootings that happened overseas um, immediately after Columbine, uh, six of them are, again, versions of Columbine. And if you look at the, just bet between 1996 and uh, 2000, uh, 1999 and 2007, there are 11 cases of thwarted school shootings where it really does seem like the kids were going to go through with it. And in all 11 of those cases, it's Columbine. They're just redoing Columbine. Um, the sociologist uh, Nick, uh, Natalie Patton has done a very similar thing where she has analyzed the YouTube videos created by school shooters because now that's what they all do before they, as they lead up to their school shooting. And what you see if you look at post-Columbine school shooting YouTube videos is that they are all, uh, they're all following the same script. They're frame by, you can do a frame by frame analysis and they're all doing the same moves. There's the, there's the shot where they point the gun at you and then at their, at their temple. Then there's a shot where they take their two pistols out like this. Then there's the shot where uh, there's the close-up where the shooter puts his, his gun right into the camera. There is, at the end, there's always a wave goodbye to the crowd, and there's always references to Eric and Dylan, right? Eric and Dylan. And what we're describing here, I think, of what these two sociologists have, are really getting at are the dynamics of a Granovarian, Granovarian riot. You know, Luc Lucatus and all those other, that cluster in the beginning are the low threshold radicals. But what Harris and Klebold are doing is they are laying out a script so precise that it makes it possible for kids with really, really high thresholds to join in. They are bridging the gap between the radicals and everybody else. They're making this particular riot more accessible. And I think this lesson goes to the question of blame. Um, Eric Harris, way back when, was not our fault. Eric Harris is a psychopath, right? He did all that himself. But John Ledoux is a very different story. He's not a psychopath. Uh, he's a nerd. And 40 years ago, he would be playing with his chemistry set in the basement and dreaming of being an astronaut because that was the available cultural narrative of that moment, right? That, was, that would be the cultural narrative that was appropriate for someone with his interests. Now he's dreaming of blowing up schools, right? He did not come up with that himself. He got it from the society of which he's a part, and we're responsible for that. And I think the second point follows from the first, um, and that is, you know, you look at the news every time one of these things happens, like with the Oregon shooting this week, and the temptation is to say, wow, you know, what a, what a society full of sick people we have. You know, what did Mike Huckabee say yesterday? We've got a problem with uncivilized savages. You know, you... you the conclusion we draw is that there seem to be an endless number of 
deeply disturbed young men capable of horrific acts. And that is 100% wrong, right? Because it misses the point of the Granovetterian progression. It's much worse than that. We are now at the point where young men no longer need to be deeply disturbed in order to contemplate horrific acts. <laughs>